This is Dr. Sargisian and today we'll talk about alteration of renal and urinary tract function. One of the common disorders of urinary tract is uh, obstruction of it and what happens blockage of urine flow occurs within the tract and blockage can occur any place in the urinary tract. So there are two main sources of this, either anatomic or functional defect, and uh, it also can be discussed as obstructive uropathy. And uh, regardless of the cause, is it anatomic narrowing of the, the uh, ureter or, or both ureters or uh, it's uh, obstruction with tumor or um, a uh, stone uh, we still need to deal with consequences so it's nice to know what's the actual source of it but our main concern is obstruction itself so we need to deal with the severity of the obstruction and the severity is depending on where it's located where the obstruction located complete or incomplete is there a urine seeping through or it's completely obstructed does it involve both upper urinary tracts both ureters or uh, just one uh, how long has been going on and what's the cause and by knowing the cause we need to understand is it preventable is it some type of kidney stone which we'll talk in a little bit or we can prevent or it's a tumor or um, something else or prostate uh, enlargement so all of these have to drive us to our understanding of urinary tract obstruction basically you need to find out uh, what's the source and you need to find out uh, what's happening how severe it is is it uh, easily reversible or you need to introduce something more drastic to reverse it kidney stones are uh, one of the factors that can cause urinary tract obstructions and especially when stone is dislodged and traveling down the urinary tract it may tend to obstruct the flow and uh, to understand kidney stone we need to uh, understand that there are substances that may inhibit growth of the crystals or stones or uh, and substances that will enforce the growth of the stones and there are also issues of particle retention to understand the stones we need to realize that stones are just crystals of uh, substances that usually are passing through the uh, renal urinary system and excreted but for one or the other reason the stones are staying in the kidney or urinary tract and uh, growing they can be very tiny like a grain of sand or smaller or uh, get to the size of the golf ball or even bigger again stones are the most common cause of urinary obstruction the demographics of stones um, development uh, vary but urolithiasis is more common in male patients and also white patients but again you, at this point you know that I won't be testing you on epidemiology uh, in this class unless I specifically tell you to know this information this is basically nice to know information so where the calculi form they would form location wise in uh, in the um, let's say renal pelvis ureters and bladder when we're thinking about uh, renal stone it's not just uniform crystal 
structure it doesn't have anything in common really with the crystals uh, you buy as jewelry such as diamonds whatever sapphires or the these stones are very compound it can be different types of fracture um, mixed together and uh, they are not very uniform um, there are different types of stone but it's not when we're talking about crystal in colloquial it's very uniform symmetric system here it's just a stone like a ball and or it may remind you just something um, like you can find on the beach or you, you can find uh, digging in the garden so there is no uniformity what types of stones we have calcium stones are <coughs> forming secondary to many different uh, factors That's, uh, these are one of the most common stones and uh, one of the one of the reasons this may form it's out um, I would say it's uh, excess of calcium maybe in dietary in intake versus increased absorption in the calcium in the small bone hyperparathyroidism another source and inability of renal tubules to reabsorb calcium chronic bowel disease uh, may result in uh, losing fats or steatorrhea and um, uh, if we are losing uh, fat you know uh, if we are losing fat, fat may uh, combine with uh, calcium and uh, at this point uh, when fat absorbed and uh, calcium is not able to bind to oxalate which will cause stone formation. So basically, steatorrhea can be a precursor of stone formation because of the calcium's inability to bind to oxalate. This is, uh, for take home message from this long sentence is that chronic bowel disease can result in stone formation and calcium stone formation. You need to know that. Treatments, um, very different for these uh, ones and uh, it's usually uh, depending on the cause and uh, you may start administering cellulose phosphates or thiazide diuretics to basically decrease dietary absorption of calcium uh, certainly if the stone gets so big that it's not uh, possible to uh, move it by non -tra uh, by traditional methods by basically uh, increasing fluid intake uh, surgical intervention may be necessary but if it's parathyroid dysfunction uh, maybe a resection surgically if parathyroid will be uh, necessary to uh, treat the hyperparathyroidism and then secondary to that we will have um, the we will decrease the calcium stone formation so struvite uh, stones which is really a fancy name for magnesium ammonium phosphate stones it, they are caused actually by bacteria and uh, urinary pH should stay at certain level to grow them at 7.2 approximately roughly and um, again you know that 7.2 is fairly acidic but if we go lower than that acidity wise uh, we certainly will have create the environment that won't be any benefit for the bacteria so we have to have this fairly narrow window of pH to grow this and unlike calcium stones these are fairly large stone 
but they may have fairly soft texture and uh, you can deduct have some uh, deductive thinking out of this okay if this is related to bacteria will the patient be more susceptible to UTI you cannot say that however may be the opposite and to make the statement clear yes the this type of stones uh, strew white stones are related or associated to fre frequent UTIs and another uh, observation here you can make that this is more common in women than in men treatment of UTI can be preventing um, you know or prevention of UTI can be preventing the formation of this type of stones how to treat the stones not only this type but even calcium stones you certainly can opt for percutaneous nephrolithotomy cystintric stones are related to abnormal exertion of amino acids or cysteine and one of uh, not only cysteine but uh, uh, lysine or lysine and arginine so but uh, these are uh, abnormal uh, stones or abnormal condition related related to amino acid uh, excess and uh, prevention will be the increase of fluid and increasing the pH of urine above 7.5 means you are creating a basic environment which will not be beneficial to the stones um, uric acid stones are large stones and uh, again pH plays a big role in here but your pH should go approximately um, around 5 or 5.5 the more acid you have the more acidic is the environment the more urite salt stones formation can be encouraged so common causes of this uh, can co can be related to I'll say this thing and you will think like he's uh, he lost his mind but uh, it can be related to rapid and dramatic weight loss and also malignancies which may cause the weight loss uh, weight loss can be related to this and again it should be dramatic so when I always you know try to find links with obesity and um, common disorders such as cardiac or even GI in this case weight loss can actually cause stones and again um, you have to watch that pH of urine and the pH drops basically very acidic urine in this situation will be encouraging the uric acid or urate salt formation these stones are fairly large but the good news is so um, you may actually dissolve them by increasing the urine pH with potassium citrate so uh, if potassium citrate is uh, introduced then at this point will be uh, the pH will go above like 6.5 from 5.5 6.5 or more then you will get rid of the stones fairly easily so this is pretty much the stone overview you need to know and the main take-home message here you may consider that pH plays significant role in this so knowing the pH will help to understand stones what happens when patient has stones the manifestations in general is renal colic it's a uh, severe pain that's uh, really truly very difficult to treat it's a colicky pains pain colicky 
that's a pain that actually fluctuates in intensity and the colic may last um, up to one hour or more and it's severe and what happens um, the, one of the examples will be that the ca uh, calculi is scratching or scraping their ureter wall and uh, it's getting that colicky quality of i mean uh, and colicky again it's a period of pain severe pain because um ureter is trying to push the stone along so it's a spasm that's pushing the stones down the road so uh, maybe the outcome will be uh, fairly nice uh, eventually when stone passes but because of scratching and uh, respond to that the contraction of ureter may lead to severe pain and pain of course radiated in the uh, flank area again evaluation of stones uh, is important because stone analysis as we talked in the previous slide may give you some clues how to treat it kidney ureter bl bladder x-ray intravenous pilogram and uh, ct scan one of the options and um, some of the options you can uh, use but again also clinical presentation maybe and one of your uh, um, clinical clues is uh, is the colicky pain again flank colicky pain then maybe you need to do some imaging um, and imaging certainly will be kub versus ivp uh, versus ct scan and usually um, in you know modern emergency rooms sometimes they would opt out for ct scanning while uh, probably plain x-ray with KUB will be uh, for more or less uh, you know diagnostic for this stone analysis again tells you how to treat it and again if it's uh, for instance uric acid stone you can just increase that pH and get rid of the stone but stone removal also may be done by percutaneous nephrolithotomy versus open um, surgery and the surgical removal and trying to get that huge stone out of the kidney but nephrolithotomy should be sufficient most stones will re respond to that and it's possible to remove it neurogenic bladder is a uh, complicated and complex and uh, sometimes very emergent condition when which uh, occurs when uh, some type of neuro disorders some type of disorder that affects uh, bladder innervation is occurring so bladder innervation destruction or obstruction or not obstruction but interruption of bladder innervations may cause neurogenic bladder so what can cause that it can cause be secondary to uh, brain or spinal cord injury uh, neurosystem tumors a brain or spinal cord infection even dementia parkinson disease spina bifida stroke um, uh, multiple sclerosis uh, there are many many other things such as alcoholism uh, lupus uh, metal poisoning uh, herpes zoster uh, and uh, certainly medications can cause this but again neurogenic bladder when we're trying to generalize this it's a um, condition that most of the time in acute setting can be related to trauma and spinal cord trauma or brain injury trauma and um, i remember from my um, clinical practice in the hospital when um, one of my uh, 
I was working as a charge nurse and one of my nurses accepted the patient from night shift who was admitted with trauma, spinal cord trauma. Unfortunately, during the whole night shift, the um, urinary function hasn't been assessed. And this is really one of the things that needs to be done in um, acute setting, certainly for everyone, but a uh, patient didn't urinate over the entire um, course of stays, approximately 11 hours, and because of spinal cord injury, he didn't uh, really felt the urge for one or the other reason, but um, my nurse at day shift was very good, and uh, uh, she basically obtained the orders to catheterize and relieve, and I remember it was approximately 3,500 milliliters, like more than three liter Coke bottle came out from that guy. So certainly uh, this is one of the neurogenic bladder instances when the function was affected secondary to spinal cord or brain trauma. Other options, other sources in acute setting you may not um, face because most of the time it's something chronic, some, something that really didn't just happen, didn't happen overnight. Obstruction can cause this and lower bladder wall compliance also may cause it. So what are the manifestations? Um, manifestations can be urinary retention and hesitancy on one hand, like in the case I just described, versus frequency and urgency. And basically it's underactive or overactive, and both cases are neurogenic the source how to diagnose neurogenic bladder you need to of course do history physical examination uh, sometime even patient in outpatient setting will be asked to keep urination diary i remember from my uh, gi days we would uh, act ask the patient keep bowel movement diary but the urology practices ask the patient to keep bladder diary Urinalysis, culture, sensitivity, cystoscopy, uh, you know, imaging procedures, MRI, uh, treatment, again, this is one of those conditions that depends on the source, treating the source. So uh, most of the time, if you treat the source, this will resolve. Urinary tract infection are one of the most common condition you encounter in primary care, and um, it's inflammation of the urinary epithelium when uh, the, the epithelium is attacked by bacteria or other pathogen basically within urinary tract. Complicated versus uncomplicated. Complicated UTI, it's recurrent UTI that usually do not or responds very vaguely to treatment while uncomplicated it's rather sporadic and the response to treatment uh, UTI complicated and persistence very uh, similar while complicated may of course the tract infection can uh, from lower urinary tract can um, travel to upper and even at, uh, uh, impair the renal function so uh, depending on the classification of the UTI, the long duration of the treatment can be different. Uncomplicated UTI occurs fairly seldom and uh, um, the treatment should be short and patient will be responsive. While we're treating complicated or persistent, treatment will be longer and it may even result in uh, quite long duration of treatment, seven to 10 days, versus in uncomplicated UTI, there are treatment regimens of three days. Uh, so depending on the nature of UTI, the treatment duration with antibiotics will um, increase. Of course, Bactrim, uh, 
is the still one of the preferred drugs to treat this although unfortunately more and more there are cases of sulfur drug allergies so you may consider switching to other drugs such as cipro to treat this but again if patient doesn't have documented allergy history to Bactrim or to sulfur drugs you certainly may try that or of course the best option is that patient already been treated in the past with sulfur and you have documented no reaction to sulfur then you can opt for treating with sulfur and uh, get great results with UTI uh, but sulfur allergy is getting more and more common so you have to be very careful while prescribing treating uh, this with uh, sulfur drugs and uh, take history taking uh, will well you will be take I know you all will be taking eventually an assessment course and history taking in UTI assessment has utmost importance because uh, it's really part of the history is to take the history of allergies because you do not really truly you don't want to give sulfur drug to someone with hypersensitivity history or uh, anaphylaxis to sulfur which again some patients would not know those fancy words and they would not say have you ever had anaphylaxis uh, I don't know what it is so I'll say no so you have to take thorough history and it will save you lots of pain as well as your patient please uh, be very uh, very very focused and very very attentive to details taking the history of something this simple as UTI so when we're talking about simplicity of UTI and fair ease of treatment of course uh, uh, complicated or persistent needs to be addressed uh, more thoroughly maybe some imaging studies needs to be done be but overall UTI is something very simple and responsive to medication but when we talk about interstitial cystitis it's uh, rather debilitating and uh, complicated condition that there is really no known cause of course we can look through literature and there are lots of hypotheses and speculation where this coming from however truly there is no known cause what happened and it's a painful uh, condition due to inflammation of the wall of the bladder wall and uh, it's often misdiagnosed as UTI unfortunately and it's often misdiagnosed as a persistent UTI with lots of antibiotics dumped into patient system um, trying to cure this and um, actually there were studies done and it takes approximately this is really outrageous but that's the truth it takes approximately four years from the time that patients start having first symptoms to the time of the actual diagnosis so um, this condition is uh, most commonly affects people around 30 year old 30 to 40 maybe a little older and also can happen in younger people uh, women are more likely to have uh, interstitial cystitis uh, than men and it's actually approximately 10 times more likely again demographics is really FYI information but uh, I won't be testing you on these numbers but it's uh, nice to know for you and it will help you to understand the disease but if you cannot memorize numbers uh, th there's no problem here because it, uh, there will be no testing and it really uh, in the big scheme of things won't affect your understanding of the disease so the treatment for interstitial cystitis is palliative so pain management and uh, also 
patient education will be important, important to educate the patient that the disease truly known curable, there is no cure, but we can have uh, fairly, um, we can have fairly successful treatment with um, medications. So urinary tract infections well let's get back to this again um, i want you to know this uh, list e coli stuff enterobacter and uh, its virulence of the pathogens important how this develops and uh, the inf how the infection develops and how the host responds to take home message from this slide, it will be essentially that you need to know what's the strongest. Um, and the strongest, of course, is E. coli. And E. coli is very closely located to urinary tract. And um, for females, it will be uh, the risk of contracting E. coli is much higher than uh, for males, of course, because it comes uh, from the GI system and uh, uh, shorter uh, urethra uh, plays a role in contracting UTI secondary to E. coli. But again, E. coli is the most common pathogen, most common among the most common. So treatment. Um, in primary care setting, you may not opt for culturing and sensitivity of uh, urinary out or of urine. While in acute care setting, you definitely want to do it to do culture and sensitivity. But in primary care setting, you just treat um, just uh, empirically with again ciprofloxacin or other antibiotic if patient is allergic to uh, I'm sorry I said ciprofloxacin with sulfur drugs with Bactrim or other antibiotics like Cipro and uh, it's really truly empiric treatment in cases when the UTI is persistent you may consider uh, definitely proceeding with U UA and culture and sensitivity and also in acute setting if patient is admitted for UTI you, so you would need culture and sensitivity of the urine but again in primary care empiric treatment and uh, most of the time it should be effective for uh, most of the strains of E. coli if it's ineffective maybe we have a virulent strain and we need to do culture and sensitivity and by sensitivity we find out which substance or which antibiotics will work better on E. coli. Cystitis is an inflammation of the bladder. Again, manifestations are very close to just uh, lower urinary tract infection, frequency, dysuria, urgency, and here is you are having a manifestation of lower abdominal and or suprapugic pain. Again, the same antimicrobial therapy may help increasing fluid intake in uh, either cystitis or uh, urinary tract infection is important, urinary analgesics and bladder irritants. Cranberry juice is maybe helpful to treat this. However, um, do not advise uh, your patients or do not teach anyone to administer cranberry juice to the patient with UTI or cystitis because you truly need a high, high concentration of cranberry extract to treat this or you need a very vigorous flow or cranberry juice to treat this. Uh, cranberry um, juice or cranberry extract prevents the attachment of the bacteria to the wall of the bladder versus wall of the ure uh, urethra, urethral walls. However, again, it may take gallons and gallons. And uh, one of the treatments to ask the patient to take cranberry pills. But again, this is just additional therapy 
and uh, you may need to consider the good old antibiotics and Bactrim and again if Bactrim is ineffective try something else or patient is allergic to Bactrim try something else Polonephritis is an acute infection of ureter renal pelvis and uh, renal parenchyma so how this develops it may very commonly come from cystitis UTI when we have obstructive UTI and we have a reflux of urine then we have a danger of developing a pyelonephritis patient will present with flank pain again fever chills uh, cortico uh, corticovertebral tenderness or corticovertebral angle or CVA tenderness purulent urine if urine becomes purulent you better do something to uh, further investigate why just uncomplicated UTI will not result in visibly purulent urine flank pain fever chills CVA tenderness and CVA tenderness we all know from the undergraduate assessment curriculum how to test that but um, patient has CVA tenderness and flank pain then it's a uh, big uh, big 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 exclamation point here that patient may have pyelonephritis needs to be treated chronic pyelonephritis usually uh, may be related to some chronic obstructive sores or chronic urinary retention so also needs to be treated treatment is antibiotic treatment in uncomplicated cases you may opt for treating it outpatient but patient if it's an if it's a complicated case <coughs> <coughs> excuse me if it's a complicated case you may consider hospitalization of the patient again fever chills purulent urine flank pain and even patient may have some symptoms of dysuria and the, which may remind you of UTI but if you have anything on this list you better consider uh, pyelonephritis versus just uncomplicated UTI and this needs to be addressed and treated as soon as you can so fever should not be coming with uncomplicated lower UTI glomerulonephropathies glomerulonephritis is the inflammation of glomerus so different drugs or different sources can affect this there may be some immunologic abnormality drug toxin vascular abnormalities systemic diseases also viral infections may cause this in case of glomerulonephritis we are observing usually a bilateral inflammation bilateral disorder that affects glomeruli and uh, typically this is a sequela of streptococcal infection uh, again this may affect more men than women and uh, in the United States this is a leading cause of renal failure inflammation and uh, with all the consequences such as congestion and cell proliferation will impair the kidney function and the ability to filter and uh, excess and get rid basically of the excess water and uh, excretion of of, uh, harmful substances glomerulonephritis again can be acute or chronic and uh, can be subdivided or subdiagnosed as nephrotic and nephritic syndrome um, 
when and those two are really one of uh, two of the most common uh, disorders related to glomerulonephritis when we having uh, a streptococcal infection this may lead to formation of immune complexes by immune complex we mean a combination of antigen and antibody which uh, circulate uh, in the blood, in circulation, and eventually they may get deposited in glomerulus. So antibodies are good and they produced against the strep organism, streptococcal organism, but the unfortunate part of this, so glomerular endothelial cells will cross-react with antibody and uh, the activations of complements will occur and recruitment activation of immune cells and mediators will occur and all of this truly results in um, acute glomerulonephritis. So what are the clinical manifestations of acute glomerulonephritis? Hematuria is a troublesome sign which you may notice in um, the patient with acute glomerulonephritis. While uh, it's often compared or contrasted with the urine of patient with hepatitis, in this case you actually may see like bloody tinged it can be brown tinge but it's definitely not hepatitis cola or guinness beer color this is more blood than uh, than bilirubin uh, in the urine so um, in this case also your lab one of the important lab finding in urine your analysis will show casts by no means presence of the cast means that it's uti casts it means that this are uh, this is presentation of glomerulonephritis protein urea low serum albumin because of that uh, we're losing protein in the urine because of permeability, patient will start developing edema. And edema, of course, is consequence of low serum albumin. Remember that osmolarity is determined uh, in the blood or in the serum by albumin concentration as well as the other um, solutes you have but at this point albumin plays critical role so patient will start developing e edema because of glomerulonephritis your patient will start developing oligouria and oligouria this is a, like a, an old uh, classic repeating again and again but still I'll say that oligouria when urine output is less than 30 milliliters an hour or 400 milliliters a day and this is like yes typical question from your NCLEX board exam versus uh, one of your med search uh, tests so this is nothing new but uh, when in the past we were studying oligouria as a uh, you know sign that needs to be just reported and to a physician or whoever in this case we need to know in this class we need to know that it's manifestation of glomerulonephritis so basically like colloquially uh, you can say yes the kidneys are shutting down so very bothersome sign in ICU. Many of you work in ICU and urine output plays critical role measurement. And so that's why you have all this uh, specific urine measuring um, Foley catheters with graduates where you can actually monitor urine output very, very closely. Nephrotic syndrome. 
is manifestation of glomerulonephritis. So let's talk about it a little bit from antibody antigen standpoint. So what happens again as I said before this antibody antigen complexes which is wonderful way of immune system to react generally which helps us a lot but this time they are basically finding a nice lodging in glomerular membrane and at this point they will start triggering the complement system so that's why this is one of the points I'm telling you guys yes that was all very important in the beginning to learn about immunity complement systems and everything else immune responses because here you'll see like this all in action nephrotic syndrome can be caused by the systemic diseases again lupus hep B diabetes uh, and it can be just idiopathic nobody knows where it came from inflammatory changes may result in basically what our concern is increased capillary permeability and capillary permeability we start losing protein and protein urea albumin is lost and uh, lipid urea fats are lost and patient will present with hypoalbuminia and uh, because of that like uh, we mentioned before patient will present with massive generalized edema very puffy very like and it's not like dependent edema it's not it's very massive and very generalized all over the level of protein in the urine may lead you to conclusion that the glomerular filtration is truly impaired because the idea is the glomerular uh, capillaries are so permeable unfortunately they are so permeable so your albumin is just slipping right into that and again urine getting dark and cloudy uh, smoky and coffee colored and smoky maybe is the difference of um, you know again from hepatitis usually hepatitis uh, like high bilirubin concentration in the urine uh, may result in um, is uh, I'm sorry in transparent but dark brown urine here if you see smoky smoky isn't hepatitis smoky and uh, dark urine is glomerular nephritis okay. um, immunoglobulins will sleep into urine as well and uh, the problem with this is that patient losing immunoglobulins and immunoglobulins are there for a reason so for immune system and if there is no immunoglobulin or low level of immunoglobulin we lost them in urine and conclusion is you can go to it deductively say that immunity level is impaired so the last word here well you'll have all these findings uh, low albumin in the blood edema and uh, lipid urea and um, also hyperlipidemia why this hyperlipidemia occurs because to compensate for the loss of fat and protein in the urine liver will increase the albumin production synthetic function of the liver as well as triglyceride and cholesterol production so in addition to all these problems you already had with glomerulonephritis uh, like it wasn't enough you have uh, 
increased risk to develop um, hyperlipidemia or patient will have hyperlipidemia with the uh, consequences of developing atherosclerosis. So causes again uh, of glomerulonephritis are the same as blah. Let's talk about renal failure and renal failure can be acute and chronic. Again, difference between acute and chronic, uh, we all know that acute is rapid, chronic is slow, maybe progressive, but it may take years to develop into full-blown disease, not only in renal failure, but everywhere else. So, but acute renal failure may progress within hours, but the good thing about acute failure, it may be reversible. And the bad news about chronic, it's usually irreversible. So, but acute will occur quite rapidly and it's abrupt reduction in renal failure, renal function, I'm sorry. Let's talk about azotemia and azotemia is uh, virtually is uh, increased urea levels in the uh, blood and uh, increased creatinine level levels probably again azotemia it's uh, increased urea and possibly creatinine level and I'll talk a little bit about labs uremia is elevated urea and creatinine level with fatigue anorexia nausea vomiting um, edema in neurologic changes I would like for you guys to be very careful with these two terms usually this is the only reason I really put it here because people still use this and um, they really nowadays use interchangeably in both senses it increase blood urea nitrogen creatinine does not have to do anything with kidneys uh, creatinine is a convenient a substance to measure kidney function. Well, I said it doesn't have to do anything with kidney. It doesn't come from kidneys, what I meant. Creatinine is the muscle breakdown product. So you don't know really what creatinine means unless you look at the patient. Like, you know, when you uh, calculate your GFR, your glomerular filtration rate, you would have and your lab will actually do it in most places would put into consideration patient weight and sex and some of them even will include like race to make a correction on it so why this app happens creatinine is creatinine is the muscle breakdown product so a if you have more muscle if you have more muscle bulk you'll have higher creatinine level. So high muscle bulk, um, there is more and more body of knowledge that ties um, uh, genetics, uh, racial makeup, and uh, gender into the creatinine level. So uh, it's a well-known fact that African Americans would have higher level of uh, creatinine because of the higher level of muscle bulk. Uh, males have higher level of creatinine because of the higher level of muscle bulk and females will have lower level of creatinine because of lower level of muscle uh, bulk. So this is all really about how much muscle you have and how much is broken down continuously. Uh, creatinine may be falsely elevated because creatine 
coming from muscles and creatinine is the breakdown product creatine um, is a supplement very popular in uh, sports uh, training which um, widely sold and uh, consumed by many professional and amateur athletes and if patients consume lots of creatine then uh, creatinine levels will artificially get elevated because they basically peeing out the unused supplement and um, the usefulness of creatine as supplement somewhat questionable maybe but there were many studies done and uh, still it's inconclusive some would say that this is harmful for kidneys the others say would not but what i'm trying to say here if someone has creatine supplementation their creatinine levels will go high uh, so when you're talking about azotemia and uremia always remember yes we mentioned creatine creatinine levels but if we will be if we are precise as a team in uremia these are uh, phenomenons related only to blood urine nitrogen or bun and uh, bun saying this is a bun bun it's not approved abbreviation again can induce um, furiousness and anger or sadness of someone you talk in i don't know you're attending physician or fellow nurse so uh, don't say bun say b-u-n just my piece of advice and i i you know so it's uh, better and not only better the correct way to abbreviate it say b-u-n so here azotemia and uremia azotemia is just increased bun and uremia is increased bun also the consequences and signs and symptoms which are listed here acute renal failure and there are three different types of renal failure you need to know you need to memorize hopefully uh, you already had some exposure to this concept before if not there is nothing to worry we'll go over them right now so pre renal renal or pre intra renal and post renal so three types pre renal intra renal and post renal okay Pre-renal. Pre-renal is the most common type of acute renal failure. So what's pre-renal? Before kidney. Before kidney you have impaired renal blood flow. And what happened? It's like heart attack for kidneys, kind of. Not really. But what happened? The renal blood flow drastically reduced. Okay, pre-renal. Classic example, it's obstruction by a tumor pressing on renal vessels and just kidney doesn't have any perfusion. Okay. If there is no blood coming in, GFR, glomerular filtration rate, declines because of the decrease in filtration pressure. Okay, that uh, makes sense, right? So if there is no pressure there in the pipes then it's oligouria again um, so acute renal failure oligouria patient doesn't produce something so something to be concerned about again oligouria not good good sign as i said before um, ischemia is heart attack myocardial infarction may lead to hypoxia and hypoxic injury and infarction and acute tubular necrosis basically infarction of the tubules so again this is pre-renal failure pre-renal 
renal and post renal this is one of the most important concepts and in this lecture uh, to distinguish between these three types of failures prerenal failure trigger is not in the kidneys it's outside it's in the blood supply to kidneys so whatever if you want to fix this fix that is whatever pressing on your blood vessels prerenally or maybe there is a tumor maybe there is a something like a plaque inside of the vessel so this all needs to be addressed to reverse it intrarenal is the second type of renal failure and intrarenal or some would say just renal heart acute renal failure um, it's uh, damage to actual renal parenchyma and um, acute tubular necrosis can happen so let's imagine this you have a big tumor pressing on renal vessels and aha uh -huh, what happened it led to acute tubular necrosis so our pre-renal failure turned into intrarenal so we can call it into two, two type post ischemic like the first case i described just not enough blood supply so pre-renal failure turning into renal and the second one is nephrotoxic injury there are millions of drugs there that's nephrotoxic and the first one that comes to mind is gentamicin and uh, lots of other drugs uh, also cortical necrosis can be happening acute glomerulonephritis again anything that kills uh, whatever parenchyma is in the cell in the kidney i'm sorry that leads to intrarenal failure but if you don't uh, know exactly what it is how to name it think about this it where is the source of this dysfunction is it before kidney is it inside of the kidney or it's after kidney so vascular disease also can be a reason for this malignant hypertension as a matter of fact hypertension is one of the main reasons people go to dialysis in this country so toxic injury again like drugs and nephrotoxin so it's all leads to intrarenal acute renal failure post renal post renal failure occurs when something as obstructs the outflow of the urine and uh, just doesn't let the urine flow away and uh, doesn't let the urine flow away from the kidneys so bph and uh, benign or maybe cancerous if i would say prostatic hypertrophy but most commonly it's bph enlargement because bph is much more common than prostate cancer will contribute to this and if the stream of the urine is obstructed the pressure will start building up and upstream and then the glomerular filtration rate would be falling down proportionally another thing is a bilateral urethral obstruction bladder outlet obstruction anything that neurogenic bladder uh, anything that doesn't just let that urine flow from the bladder out or before the bladder but if we cannot evacuate urine it eventually will turn into post renal failure so these are three concepts you need to know for ever and ever and ever and ever so let's talk about clinical manifestation of acute renal failure of course oligouria and urea elevated buen and creatinine hyperkalemia and metabolic acidosis
hypertension because of the volume overload may occur. And basically this is um, becoming very big systemic disorder because when we have renal failure, we are not able to produce urine and all this fluid will be backed into the uh, circulation and cause hypertension. Chronic renal failure is irreversible loss of renal function. And uh, as acute renal failure, it may affect organ systems outside of the renal system. However, in acute, because the things may go bad and improve quite fast, this may not happen. In chronic, we usually see the manifestation in all organ systems. The renal reserve will be lowered and at some point patient will start experiencing renal insufficiency, renal failure, and end stage renal disease. All the stages are described and determined using glomerular filtration rate determination. Chronic real failure can be uh, affecting creatinine and urea levels, sodium and water balance, phosphate, calcium, potassium, and acid base balance will be affected. So how it can affect in general the other systems, um, the everything pretty much affected because of sodium and phosphate imbalance the skeletal and bone or alterations will occur losing calcium cardiopulmonary manifestation neural function endocrine and reproduction and erythropoietin production will decrease or cease so from here hematologic alterations will occur chronic renal failure can uh, affect immunologic, GI, integumentary systems. Again, protein, carb, and lipid metabolism affected because of the loss of proteins and lipids, and liver will try to compensate and leading to hyperlipidemia. Uh, so, GF, CFR, I'm sorry, will be gradual increase and uh, will be uh, leading to all these alterations. So let's talk about progression of chronic renal failure. And uh, again, chronic renal failure is gradual progression of the disease. It's a well-known fact that diabetes type 1 and type 2 is leading cause of chronic renal failure and as a sequela of vascular damage and not just vascular damage but uh, damage to endothelial lighting. Number two is hypertension and also the other is urine obstruction uh, not to that extent as hypertension and diabetes but urolithiasis and BPH certainly can block urine flow which is post-renal acute may gradually turn or maybe not so acute but this is post-renal failure that will turn into a chronic renal failure. Other things is renal diseases, polynephritis, glomerulonephritis, renal artery stenosis, this is one of the pre-renal sources and toxic exposure. I didn't mention the sickle cell disease but certainly this one is worth mentioning and lupus and smoking another um, another gun in your anti-smoking campaign ammunition so yes yeah, smoking will do atherosclerotic 
changes in blood vessels and um, the smaller the vessels are the worse this if or the better the worse the they affect it and the uh, kidneys have lots of small vessel and to in addition to that smoking is a great vasoconstrictor so this leads to chronic ischemia and necrosis and of course i didn't mention age the older the patient is the more the gfr affected and glomerular filtration rate reduces so and let's look at the numbers here when we're talking about reduced renal reserve um, we're still all right but your GFR and again GFR is a calculated uh, number by Kortko formula or other more sophisticated um, formulas but GFR doesn't matter which way we calculated it but you see steady reduction to half of the normal GFR so patient may function fairly well at 50% of GFR but in the getting to the um, quarter of the function of, or quarter of the GFR will be determined will be described as renal insufficiency failure occurs when it's significant loss of function and GFR is less than 20% of normal but patients still can function and may have some signs and symptoms of this but still would be um, not so affected is especially if they are at this upper range at 20 percent but of course it's very difficult to function for the patient when this uh, rate starts to decline and um, end-stage renal failure when we are already raising the idea or the thought about or consideration about dialysis versus kidney transplant and this is the whole um, big huge topic about this dialysis and kidney transplant so it's all really to make it more um, less complex you have to consider many factors that will be determining what to do dialysis versus kidney transplant the patient's comfort availability of the donors availability of the matching kidney uh, genetic makeup because again transplant it's not an easy procedure I, in any transplant it's not like changing the tire on a car so uh, you just can't get the part and fix it and that's then it's done good as new no transplant is um, unfortunately some transplants may require lifelong immunosuppressive therapy so this is may actually having a transplant decrease quality of life of the patient uh, which um, may be on peritoneal dialysis or um, hemodialysis and versus having the transplant so this is to summarize it this last statement it's, it's all on case by case basis and all uh, it's all really uh, the individualized decision has to be made renal insufficiency occurs when uh, again gfr is reduced to 25 percent patient will still have mild clinical symptoms which will be related to mild uremia uh, bn creatinine will increase maybe some mild anemia yes again erythropoietin and um, during the stress this is like you would say what that has to do with it the renal function is impaired and like uh, a, this is very easy explanation there there is more and more blood circulating through kidneys and the ra rates for filtration and the needs for filtration is increased so the stressful situation will affect kidney function and it will actually reduce the kidney function when we're talking about renal failure 
GFR less than 20, BUN creatinine continue to increase, oligo-urea, urea, urine output is just uh, very small, metabolic acidosis can set in with electrolyte imbalances with hyperkalemia and hypernatremia, anemia becoming severe, Erythropoietin probably shots will be very, very helpful to the patient, sub-Q shots, and uremia that may affect non-renal organs, other. So renal disorders can be very debilitating and impaired quality of life of the patient. And again, this may result in a complex disorders and diseases affecting multiple organs and I just would like to add uh, a couple of words about the prevention of renal disorders and uh, most of it you already know but again diabetes and hypertension are two of the precursors of the renal disorders chronic renal failure and uh, need for dialysis and uh, Unfortunately, the, rent, the rates tend to increase. So from your point of view as future uh, professionals in nursing with advanced degree, please don't forget it that seemingly easy to treat diseases like diabetes and uh, hypertension uh, may lead to the devastating consequences. And I'm saying seemingly easy to treat diseases. Treating those is uh, lots of work, both for patient and for the provider. And from this point of view, obviously you want to get better outcomes. You want to have better outcomes for your patient and uh, you will try your best in this and you will have uh, if you succeed in treating these two disorders you will prevent lots of um, harm and lots of damage to your patient's health and uh, give them or support them or uh, uh, support them in their healthy lifestyle and uh, increase their lifespan and uh, increase the quality of life and this really boils down to these fairly simple disorders as diabetes and hypertension and by simple I really mean there is treatment available and most people would respond to it and having that treatment available will prevent not only these complications but also will be saving lots of costs for this patient. This will conclude the lecture for renal disorders. Again, uh, please email me, call me, text me if you have any questions about this. And um, I appreciate you being such a great audience. And I know I cannot see you or uh, hear you at this time but you certainly make up for it with your great questions and great attitude towards this course and I really truly enjoy interacting with you even on that level so uh, again please call me text me let me know uh, what's going on if you have any questions and good luck with the test